tonight on CBC Vancouver News. When you find somebody and then you can't get them in, uh, it's really, really frustrating. Just step up onto the white squares. Why hitting the local mountains may be harder this season. Also, when your kids are asking where mom is. A warning from a local former anti-vaxxer. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty tough some days. His wife is in critical care with COVID and uncertain chances of survival. And how much air or particles are leaking into the respirator. Inside the Vancouver lab. So we're loading a mask right now into the sample holder. Testing whether your PPE actually works. And do we have penetration here? No, no we don't. So this, this is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Well, Canada has lifted its blanket advisory against non-essential travel outside the country. But as the CBC's Michelle Gassoub reports, despite the change, traveling internationally is likely to remain expensive and unpredictable. Uh, there was lots of cancelled flights involved. There was um, lots of phone calls uh, to airlines. Travelling during a pandemic, not for the faint of heart. Claire Beveridge recently returned from the UK. She warns travellers to expect the unexpected. I would classify myself as someone who's very organised and very on the ball when it comes to these kind of things. And even I found it quite complex um, and quite a tedious process. This travel agent says even with the advisory being lifted, would-be travellers are still at the whim of other countries ever changing testing and quarantine requirements. She's had clients end up stranded and facing hefty hotel bills. We have to keep checking what the policy from the country or from the city to allow you to go in there. So today I tell you this policy, but it might change in one day later. Earlier this week, Hong Kong banned Air Canada passenger flights from Vancouver for two weeks due to a COVID-19 exposure. Premier John Horgan cancelled his trip to Washington State, citing testing concerns. Uh, so having to get a test in Vancouver to confirm that I was traveling uh, outside the country didn't make any sense to me. Uh, the borders are not open to all British Columbians yet, so uh, I've cancelled the trip. Uh, I very much regret that. That's me and my dad. You look so much like yeah, your dad. <laughs> for Beveridge, despite logistics and cost, the trip was worth it to see family missed for three long years. I would make the effort because that's where I'm from, but would I make the effort just to go on holiday to like Hawaii? Maybe not. But there's some advice to keep in mind. Get yourself a spreadsheet on the go. Write down your arrival dates, what that's classified for in your countries. And if you do decide to travel, let your travel agent know you've made it home safe. Once you arrive, I just make a joke. Don't call your honey. Don't call your sweetheart. Call me first. You arrive in Vancouver. And while airplanes might be okay, for those itching for a sea trip, maybe wait. A blanket advisory against all cruise travel remains in place. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. A former self-described anti-vaxxer in northeastern BC says he made the wrong choice in ignoring the risks of COVID-19. Now his pregnant wife is in critical care and it's not clear if she'll survive. The man spoke with our Andrew Kuryata and as he watches and waits for his wife to recover, he's desperately trying to convince others to get their shots. Dwayne Bennett starts each day with a phone call to find out if his wife is still alive. She can make it through the day. She can, can she do another day? So that's the big thing right now. Bennett is in Fort St. John, but his pregnant wife, Crystal, who belongs to the Prophet River First Nation, is more than 1,200 kilometres away in a medically induced coma in hospital in New Westminster, while Bennett stays in quarantine, caring for their young children. When you're away from the, your wife who's dying in the hospital and you're under quarantine and your kids are asking where mom is, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty tough some days. Neither Bennett or his wife were vaccinated. He says he was worried about the health impacts and a distrust of government drove him to disinformation online. If I, if I could go back and change things, I definitely would. I mean, I was pretty set in my ways against getting this vaccination. I had multiple arguments with, with family, with, with people on, on social media. and It, it turns out that vaccinations is a life-saving thing. But the science shows getting vaccinated during pregnancy is safe, while the risk posed by COVID-19 is high for both parents and their unborn children. 
We do know that there is an increased risk of severe illness requiring hospitalization or ICU care if you get COVID-19 when you're pregnant. It's a message Bennett now wishes he had listened to and one he encourages others to take to heart before it's too late. If you've seen a speeding truck about, about to hit one of your family members, you would jump into action and save their life. So if I could go back in months, I would have our whole family vaxxed and her life would be saved right now. I am sure of it. Andrew Curietta, CBC News, Prince George. And even with warnings like that and other efforts across B.C. to get people vaccinated, some are still getting left behind. That includes Indigenous youth who have had a much lower vaccine rate compared to their elders and non-Indigenous youth. Benit Breach looks into the reasons. This 19-year-old got COVID in August. So I had some family members that were also infected and they were very, very impacted by the virus, you know. And so that's impacted me and my family and the community that I live in. But he is still one of many Indigenous youth not yet vaccinated. I have free will. You know, I have the right to determine my health, my status. Only about 54% of youth are double vaxxed. And if you look at non-Indigenous youth, 73 to about 82% are fully vaccinated in B.C. And there are many reasons why young people in the Indigenous community are choosing to stay unvaccinated. Mistrust of government, vaccine safety, side effects, fertility, and cultural safety. Dr. McDonald says history appears to be at the forefront. Uh, residential school issues being front and centre and the Indian hospitals being front and centre. There's a lot of discussion about trust. I get asked all the time, are we being experimented on? For others, the vaccine was a tough but necessary decision, especially for mobility and travel. Ultimately, what drove me to go and get it and also the idea of wanting to go and visit family. She says more action is needed from the government to connect with Indigenous youth. I feel like there definitely could have been a lot more um, information sharing and quest questions answered within communities. So it may be that we didn't communicate that risk as being universal in the way that we probably should have. And more options are being explored. But the most effective work is often the face-to-face. -face. And uh, it's very hard to do that when there are 203 communities we're serving, plus our urban population. Benit Braich, CBC News, Vancouver. The Assembly of First Nations is urging BC to expand its COVID-19 booster shot program to include elders. In an appeal to BC's top doctor, the AFN is calling for immediate action, saying Indigenous leaders are concerned about rising infection rates and breakthrough cases. During the pandemic, designated vaccine clinics opened in some Indigenous communities, and around the province, many of those communities have been closed to outside visitors to prevent the spread of infection. Thirteen more people have died from COVID-19 since yesterday in B.C., and there are 649 new cases. Let's bring in our Justin McElroy now, as we do on Fridays. And, Justin, cases trending downward last week. Is that still a reality now? Yeah, unfortunately not, Anita. After a couple of weeks of seeing sustained decreases in, in transmission, mostly across the province, this week saw disappointing news. So if you take a look at the board where we look at both the active cases, the rolling average of cases and hospitalizations, you can see those numbers for the rolling average going up about 11% or so. Active cases as well going back up slightly after a few weeks there of really good news. So uh, the province still believes that its current framework is working in order to decrease transmission at least for the last seven days or so we didn't see it and with the province allowing a hundred percent capacity for events there's a little bit of concern in some circles over what we might see as a result of that in the weeks ahead no doubt we'll be watching closely and you know we've said for a while now that bc's north is particularly concerning but it seems to be getting worse so how bad are we talking here 
It's about the same level in the north as all of Alberta or Saskatchewan right now in terms of transmission. I want you to take a look at this next chart. It shows the per capita case count, the rolling average in all five health authorities in the province. And you can see northern not only is it much higher than anywhere else in BC, it's had this huge spike up in the last week, even higher to where it was before. So you see, you know, sometimes we talk about a tale of two pandemics. It's certainly a big change right now between the north and everywhere else in BC. But if you look at those numbers, though, the rest of uh, the province, even though it's not going up, it's not having the sustained transmission that we really need to see in order for more people to be safe across the province. Yeah, that really is incredible to see on that chart. Thank you, Justin. More than 1,500 workers at Life Labs clinics across the province are going on strike tonight. They served 72-hour strike notice on Wednesday after months of failed negotiations. Workers have been without a contract since April, and wages appear to be the main sticking point. The union says their job action begins tomorrow with a rally at a Burnaby lab. Life Lab says some clinics will be impacted, but most operations will continue as normal because they are deemed an essential service. Well, ski resorts across the country are hoping for a bounce back this year with domestic and international travelers heading to the slopes this winter. Though, as the CBC's Brady Strachan explains, the challenge is bringing in enough workers, especially foreigners, who traditionally make up a large part of the industry's workforce. Slip in there. Okay. Lindsay Bennett helps skiers get the perfect boot fit. It's a specialized skill that requires trained staff. And this year, he's having a hard time securing them. These are people that uh, have an incredible skill set that I need. And when you find somebody and then you can't get them in, uh, it's really, really frustrating. Although things are quiet on the ski hill now, Big White Ski Resort will open its run in just over a month. The challenge this year is finding staff. Since I've been here in 1985, this is the biggest problem we've seen with this. Big White hires 600 workers, many of them from abroad on working holiday visas. But so far, they have less than half that number secured. He says many potential workers are pulling out, as Canada hasn't approved their visas yet. That's a shame because like the project was already like set, and and I was like I was thinking I'm gonna I'm already gonna work in Canada this winter, so I now I have to change my plans. Ski areas across the country are having trouble bringing in enough workers. The Canadian Ski Council says up to 30 percent of positions may go unfilled. The industry is asking Ottawa for help bringing in more foreign workers by processing more visa applications and extending working holiday visas for workers already in Canada. This is a two-stage gondola. So Revelstoke Mountain Resort is also feeling the labour crunch. The ski lifts will be fully staffed, but other parts of the resort could suffer. Probably the, some of the most challenging areas are in our food and beverage operations and really in our hospitality sector as well as the hotel operations, uh, particularly around culinary and housekeeping roles. That could mean restaurants open shorter hours or limited services at hotels. Back at Big White, the resort is predicting a busy year on the mountain with lots of overtime for the workers they do have. Brady Strack and CBC News, Big White Ski Resort, British Columbia. Vancouver police have arrested a man seen walking downtown waving what appeared to be a gun. The 54-year-old man was taken into custody last night. He's alleged to have a replica handgun and other weapons in his possession. The man was seen Tuesday morning holding and pointing the gun, realistic looking, but it was a fake. He was also seen on surveillance footage making threatening gestures. Police are recommending firearms-related charges. The B.C. Court of Appeal has unanimously dismissed the appeal of a Surrey mother convicted of killing her eight-year-old daughter. A warning to our viewers, this story does contain some disturbing details. Lisa Batstone was convicted of second-degree murder after smothering her daughter, Tegan, seven years ago. She appealed her conviction and sentence after the trial, arguing her mental health was not given enough consideration and that manslaughter was a more suitable charge. In a written decision, the court determined the trial judge may have made errors, but they were harmless and did not impact the outcome. Bat Stone was sentenced to life in prison in 2019. Well, it was a historic agreement that gave a B.C. First Nation in the Northeast more control over its lands. Now it's rippling through the energy industry. The case involves the Blueberry River First Nation. 
As Kyle Bax reports, they successfully argued too much development in the territory limited their treaty-protected right to hunt, fish, and trap. Hovering more than 100 meters in the air, Chief Marvin Yahe surveys his community's territory, the many sun-soaked lakes and forests, and all the development too, from oil and gas sites to forestry and farming. What Yahe can't see are any moose or caribou. That's why the Blueberry River First Nations took the provincial government to court and won. This summer, the B.C. Supreme Court ruled the province failed to maintain the nation's rights to hunt and fish, saying while not one single project was to blame, all the development had a devastating effect on the community. Now, the First Nation has signed an interim agreement with the province and the chief says gained decision-making power. It's extremely important that our views are taken very seriously. Many other First Nations could take similar court action, including those in Alberta's oil sands. That really does change the law in Canada and, and potentially opens the door to similar claims all across the country. There are concerns about the economic fallout and difficulty getting projects built. Companies are making spending plans for next year amid an uncertain future. So there's a lot of money at stake for them. The B.C. government could have appealed the lower court ruling, but in the spirit of reconciliation, decided not to. We believe it's the right way forward and we're committed to working with the nations and indeed all of Treaty 8 nations to achieve a better outcome for all in the future. About 85% of Blueberry territory is within 500 metres of an industrial site, showing how little of the land is untouched. The places that I grew up in, you know, hunting, trapped, and, you know, there, there, there's nothing there now. Chief Yahe says the Blueberry are not opposed to development as many members work in those local industries. He just wants a say in how it is done. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Fort St. John. Right now, there are about 40 shipping containers floating off Vancouver Island. The MV Zim Kingston was bound for Vancouver when it came across some rough seas early this morning, and the containers fell overboard. They have now been spotted about 70 kilometers west of the entrance to the Juan de Fuca Strait. The Canadian Coast Guard has issued a navigational warning for other ships in that area, and it is assessing the possibility of pollution or other hazards from the containers. Okay, we're going to a story in Tofino now where some surfers are enjoying the extreme weather. Take a look. Yeah, exciting. It's totally exciting. An intense weather system rolled in yesterday, bringing winds as high as 100 kilometers an hour. The strong gusts of wind knocked out power to parts of Vancouver Island, and the coast is bracing for more. Johanna, I think uh, they're of the few maybe that really love this weather. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, Anita, but I'm not alone. I've got to tell you, uh, meteorologists right across the Pacific Northwest, well, we've been talking nonstop all day about this next storm. But let me take you back to pictures because this is uh, going to be our third of three storms. You can see more pictures from across the island yesterday. Those 100 kilometer per hour wind gusts bringing down trees leading to uh, the widespread power outages. And as we mentioned earlier in the fall season, uh, some connections to the heat dome, a lot of our trees extra stressed and weakened. So big wind storms are of a concern and that's why we're especially concerned about the storm Sunday night into Monday. It is just forming as it tracks towards uh, the south coast for Sunday night, uh, going through a process called bombogenesis. I cannot make that up. That's a meteorological term. Uh, but I'm going to let our Mal Castellan from Environment Canada, who shares my uh, nerding out on the storm, by the way, uh, take you through that definition. The nerd in me is totally obsessed with looking at how strong this is going to get. A weather bomb, technically speaking, is when there's so much cyclogenesis, which is a fancy term to say that it's a deepening storm, and that it deepens at a rate of 24 hectopascals, or millibars, in 24 hours. In this case, it's doing much more than that. It might even be 40 hectopascals in 24 hours, um, which is extraordinary, and that's why it's so academic and so interesting. See 
I didn't make up that term, a uh, cyclogenesis happening, but it's happening so quickly. We call this bombing out. So here are the special weather statements that Environment Canada has already issued. Uh, right now, 70 to 100 kilometer per hour winds for the west and north side of the island in the Sunshine Coast. But for Metro Vancouver, north and westerly sections of the city, 50 to 80 kilometers per hour. That's Sunday night into Monday morning. At this point, we have moderate confidence in this storm track. So we're still far enough away. Those winds could e increase or decrease as we watch this storm begin to take form. So it's really just beginning its deepening process. But as it approaches, we're going to see waves really pick up for Tofino. It's going to stall out just off the West Coast for Sunday, uh, weakening as it does so, but uh, big surf and big waves, a certainty for the West Coast of the island. It's exactly how strong those winds will get for Metro Vancouver that we'll have to keep you posted on. I'm going to break it down uh, coming up later on in the show, but also be watching this throughout the weekend because, Anita, this has the potential to be uh, one of our most significant wind events that we've seen in some time. So uh, I'll take you through the uh, deep and probably try and throw in Bombogenesis one more time. Who I was, am I kidding? I was just going to say, I think there's a song in there somewhere. I'll wait for it with, so you two, with you two uh, nerdy weather <laughs> people. Mm -hmm. We got this. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. And we want to show you now photos of those 40 shipping containers that are floating off Vancouver Island. Take a look at this. This is the MV Zim Kingston. It was bound for Vancouver, came across some rough seas early this morning, and all of those containers fell overboard. Uh, the Coast Guard has issued a navigational warning for ships in the area and trying to figure out if there's been any pollution that's gone into the water or any other hazards from those containers. We'll be keeping a watch on this tonight, and Dan will have more at 11 o'clock. Okay, so I got to go on a little bit of a field trip today to Vancouver General Hospital. Take a look. The pandemic has made the importance of PPE clear to many of us, but for healthcare workers, they've always known it's vital in protecting them. We are at Western Canada's first accredited PPE testing lab, making sure the gear is up to Canadian standards. So first off, why and how was this lab created? At the beginning of the pandemic, Vancouver Coastal Health, in conjunction with the Ministry of Health and Provincial Health Services Authority, recognized the importance of ensuring that every piece of PPE, whether it's a mask, an N95 respirator, or a gown, met stringent North American standards. There are so many things that can be tested in this lab, so what are you actually testing for? We're testing for the particle filtration of mask and N95 respirators, the fluid resistance, the flammability, the breathability of it, and we're also testing uh, the fluid resistance for the gowns. Okay, let's go check out these tests. Sounds good. Uh, what we're doing right now is we're using beeswax to form a seal around the respirator so it fits into the uh, containment box because it has to be an airtight system when assessing filtration efficiency. And so this test is, assess is really assessing the material respirator itself and how well that filters out uh, aerosols. And how many times would you perform a test like this on each mask? There's different, uh, different protocols and different test methods, so it really depends on what the end user is going for. It could be a few samples, it could be up to 20 samples, or large production lots, it could be uh, beyond that. So this test is one of the standard test methods for medical masks uh, that we assess the fluid resistance. Of. And so it uses synthetic blood at fixed pressures to make sure that the mask is not going to allow penetration of blood. And what we do is shoot it with two mils of synthetic blood. And as you can see, looking at the mask, it hits the mask and we look for penetration of synthetic blood. Looking at the back, we do see a little bit on this sample. Okay, so this station here is for, it's called quantitative fit testing of N95 respirators. So this test is to ensure that respirators will form a good seal on your face. And so this containment area here is to ensure that the aerosol we generate in the corner there stays within the, within the area here. So I will get you to put on a respirator and you can take off your medical mask. So there'll be a series of exercises that, we, that I will ask you to do. And the first step is just normal breathing. So just breathe in and out normally. And so what's happening here is we have two hoses. One of them, the blue one, is sampling the ambient air and that's giving us the particle concentration in ambient air. 
The other one is attached to the respirator, and so that's sampling within the airspace within the respirator, and that's giving us the particle concentration inside there. And it's the, that ratio of those two particle concentrations that lets us know how much air or particles are leaking into the respirator. And it's a fail. Your overall fit factor was a five. I failed. So that respirator is not a good fit for you. So to pass the test, you need 100. And I seem to have five. This is not a good fit. <laughs> A horrifying accident on a film set, one that saw actor Alec Baldwin shoot and kill one of the filmmakers. More details emerging from a production that was facing a slew of issues. Next. Thanks for sticking with us during our commercial free live stream. A New Brunswick farmer has 150 kinds of apples on his orchard, including some considered historical. Visitors can see apple varieties as old as King Louis XIII, but with high costs of farming and land being sold to real estate developers, growing apples has become a shrinking business. My name is Daryl Hunter. I live on Keswick Ridge. I have a small hobby orchard. It's it's a unique orchard. It has, over the, over the years, I've had over 150 different kinds of apples in my orchard. I experimented with different root stocks. I, I experimented with different varieties of apples, uh, which ones would cook the best, uh, at making apple cider, uh, all the things you could do with apples. And the objective that I had originally was to try to preserve some of the historic varieties of apples that you can't get anymore. Uh, they're coming from all over the world. Oh, oh. oh look at that. Did you get that? <laughs> I did. Oh, oh God. <laughs> I only got about 30 trees left, but each tree has multiple types of apples on it. So to me, you can only propagate apples by grafting. you got to learn how to graft. And that always fascinated me because it's kind of like immortality. The tree hasn't died. It might have died there, but I got a piece off it to keep it going. And that's when I think of the trees that I got to go back to the 1600s, it's the same piece of that tree. You're getting to taste the same apple uh, that King Louis XIII in Orleans, France tasted. I'm a sixth generation farmer on Keswick Ridge. I farm with my two sons who happen to be the seventh generation. And uh, we've been in apple production since 1875. In the greater Keswick Ridge area, uh, mid 1975-76, there was about 500 acres of orchard in production. And today, in 2021, there's less than 30 on Keswick Ridge. Farmers will produce whatever's economically viable. And right now, we're running ourselves a 10-acre processing orchard. And so we turn our apples into apple cider, apple syrups. We're looking at other processed products that could fit into our farm. And but then you also got to include the fencing. You've got to fence the deer out. And uh, deer are a big, big problem for, for uh, farmers today in Keswick Ridge area. We are seeing some replanting happening finally in the area. Uh, these are new farmers coming in and, and getting involved in, in apple production. Uh, a lot of the historical, there's only three of us left that have got some orchard from, from back in the 70s. The onset death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins has left many unanswered questions. In what appears to be a terrible accident, Hollywood star Alec Baldwin fired a prop gun that killed her. Chris Reyes brings us a new detail from investigators who say a crew member thought the prop gun was empty before it was handed to the actor. 
Those muffled sounds of emergency crews responding to shots fired, the first public signs of a tragedy on this New Mexico movie set. Friday morning, police said that two people were shot accidentally by actor Alec Baldwin, the film's star and producer. 51-year-old Joe Souza, the director, was injured. 42-year-old Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer, died in hospital. We really lost an um, amazing friend here and a beautiful woman, talented woman, and we all know how difficult it is to to become a cinematographer in Hollywood, you know, and she actually did it. So that profession was a dream come true for her. Baldwin was seen in tears outside the Santa Fe Sheriff's office. He later tweeted, there are no words to convey my shock and sadness regarding the tragic accident that took the life of Helena Hutchins. The actor also said he's offering support to Hutchins' family, including her husband and young son. Police said some kind of projectile hit Hutchins when Baldwin discharged a prop weapon. The movie Rust is an American Western. We work with actual real firearms. A lot of people are under the impression that these are movie guns or that they are somehow uh, a film gun or a film weapon. That's not true. There have been prior complaints from workers about unsafe handling of guns on set. Hutchins made this video just days ago. Her friends remember a talented filmmaker who was dedicated to her craft and defined odds when she moved to Hollywood from Ukraine to follow her dream. I am pretty much sure that she would love that film to continue because as a director of photography, she worked so hard to, receive, to actually make this possible to be there as a cinematographer. Police have not laid any charges. The Screen Actors Guild Union is also looking into what led to the shooting. Film sets must follow strict rules when using weapons. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. A CBC Marketplace investigation reveals hundreds of illegal CBD products are being sold on this country's thriving black market. Going undercover, the team found they are easily available. And as Stephen D'Souza reports, some salespeople are making misleading health claims about them. And then we do have tinctures, which are like oil droppers for stress, anxiety, insomnia. They operate right out in the open. Unlicensed stores selling CBD or cannabidiol a cannabis extract that's touted as a wonder drug that some promise can heal without getting you high. So okay, whatever your body needs, whatever the situation uh, is, health? CBD will help that. It's like it can do anything, really. Kind of like a superpower almost. But as our Marketplace hidden camera investigation shows, the products they're selling online and in stores and the health claims they're making are all illegal. And experts worry mislabeled ingredients and possible contaminants could be putting Canadians at risk. Canadians are buying these products, and in the absence of evidence, they are going by marketing claims. And that's a real problem. CBD is legal in Canada, but here, unlike the US, CBD is a controlled substance. That means only government licensed retailers can legally sell it. That hasn't stopped the sale of illicit products, everything from oils and creams to gummies and pet products. And because CBD is a controlled substance, Researchers, even Marketplace, can't legally test them. U.S. researchers found many similar products mislabeled or containing undisclosed THC. These products can be acquired by anyone in Canada with an internet connection and a, uh, you know, a credit card, but you can't actually test what all these people are using, which seems very counterintuitive. While CBD does show promise for treating a host of conditions, experts say the price does add up and more study is needed including how CBD interacts with other drugs like opioids and blood thinners. It is not cheap, and let's remember, there's no utopia. I would say maybe one in three individuals might find benefit from this. In a statement to Marketplace, Health Canada wouldn't say if they'll remove CBD from the list of controlled substances. They said they are reviewing the laws around cannabis, but a report won't come until about 2023. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. Watch the full investigation to find out what happens when Stephen D'Souza tries CBD tonight at 8 p.m. on CBC and CBC Gem. A warning tonight from the government. If you get laid off because you won't get a COVID vaccine, don't count on support from Ottawa. Why you might not be entitled to EI. That's next.
The biggest hospital in British Columbia is taking a bold new step. It opened an institute today where alternative medicines will be practiced and studied. Acupuncture, herbal remedies, massage therapy, and much more. Here's the CBC's Ian Hannah Mansing. It's not what you'd expect to see at a Canadian hospital, influencing the body's energy with healing touch. Or how about this? It's very relaxing. Ear candling for headaches and sinus problems. It's all part of a new institute at the Vancouver Hospital Complex. Organizers say it's the first of its kind in North America, a major hospital where a variety of alternative and complementary medicine will be scientifically tested. The goal, bringing some of it into mainstream healthcare. The Institute's president, a highly regarded pediatric specialist and professor, says conventional medicine has a lot to learn. We would take advantage of what has been going on uh, in other parts of the world for the last 2,000 years or more and bring the best so that we can assess it, prove it. It's no coincidence the Institute is in Vancouver where Asian immigrants have created a demand for alternative medicines. But it's much more than an ethnic niche market. My mental attitude completely changed when I felt somebody say to me, we can make you better. Angel McClure never considered alternatives until her doctor told her she had an incurable bowel irritation and suggested surgery or drugs. A friend suggested a local acupuncturist. I was a little skeptical. I came down, I was like, what have I got myself into? But um, I've been here for approximately two months and I can't tell you how great I feel. BC's Doctors Association says it actually welcomes the Institute. Physicians like Kate Payton, who treats eye tumors, says it's important patients find out what works and perhaps more importantly, what doesn't. I've got the occasional patient who goes to Mexican clinics. I've seen people do all kinds of things and I'd like to make sure that they're getting value for their money and that they're not delaying other things that are known to be effective in the meantime. Vancouver area hospitals have committed hundreds of thousands of dollars to the annual budget of this institute. That may seem surprising at a time of shrinking healthcare dollars. But people here say the hope is in the long term, alternative therapies can help keep people out of hospital and make them healthier. Ian Hannah Mansing, CBC News, Vancouver. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The BC Court of Appeal has unanimously dismissed the case of a Surrey mother guilty of suffocating her eight-year-old daughter. Lisa Batstone was convicted of second-degree murder. She appealed her conviction and sentence after her trial, arguing her mental health issues were not given adequate weight and the judge was wrong to find she had the intent to kill. The appeal was rejected. Mistrust of government vaccine safety, side effects, fertility, and cultural safety. Just some of the reasons why vaccine rates among Indigenous youth in BC are low. 90% of elders in that community have two shots, but only about 54% of young people are fully vaccinated. Well, for workplaces with vaccine mandates, failing to get the shot can lead to you losing your job. Yesterday, Canada's Minister of Employment suggested it might also mean losing employment insurance. As Travis Dunraj tells us, that sparked some support today and some furious pushback. Employment lawyer Paul Champ says it's been pretty busy at his Ottawa office. We're getting uh, multiple calls a day on this. Calls from workers concerned about getting fired for not being vaccinated and how that could affect them qualifying for EI. Both in, in uh, contract employment law and under the Employment Insurance Act, an employee who's let go is entitled to you know, either severance uh, and EI benefits uh, when they're not guilty of misconduct. The question is what constitutes misconduct? Yesterday, when asked about employees flouting vaccine mandates, 
the employment minister weighed in. It's a condition of employment that hasn't been met, and the employer choosing to terminate someone for that reason would make that person ineligible for EI. That comment was quickly applauded by some, slammed by others. It was not a condition of employment when my members began their career. It's an arbitrarily decided condition of employment to receive the vaccination or to implement a policy that mandatory vaccinations. Still, some lawyers believe the global pandemic justifies the government denying benefits. I think that everyone still has the right to do what they want to with their bodies, but the employers and the government have a right to say, if you don't do this, then these are the consequences. Now, the final policy decision on how the EI system deals with employees that resist vaccine mandates hasn't been made yet. That will be up to the next cabinet, set to be unveiled Tuesday. Travis Danrush, CBC News, Ottawa. At 6.39, you're looking at a live shot of Tofino. A quiet Saturday ahead weather-wise, but Sunday, well, Sunday is looking very exciting. Johanna will tell us all about it next. I'm Dr. Alison Novak. I'm a scientist here at the Kite Research Institute at the University Health Network. Today we are in a home lab, which is one of our many simulated laboratory spaces at Kite. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about my research that focuses on fall prevention and how to design our environment to best support aging in place and to prevent falls uh, in the home. And so I'm going to talk to you about two places that are really hazardous within our homes, and that's our bathrooms and our stairs. There's several features of a staircase that are really important when we consider design elements that contribute to fall risk. One of the main ones is the size of the steps. So a step that is too short in length and a step that is too high in height um, really contributes to risk of falling. So you, your, your foot exceeds the size of the step. That's an issue. Um, the other one is, for instance, for an older adult, if they don't have enough strength, then it's difficult for them to navigate a higher step, to pull their foot up and clear that step. So we've done a series of studies where we looked at handrail design parameters and how they contribute to your ability to recover your balance if you've fallen. And so what we found is handrails that are designed like this, where they have what we call a graspable portion, they're actually ineffective at preventing a balance loss. Okay. So you can grasp this, but you'll still, you are more likely to fall if you grasp this than if you were to grasp something like a round handrail where you can get what we call a power grip. So that's your hands wrapped around the underside of the handrail. This, a round handrail would be your most optimal shape for preventing the fall from happening. bathroom is one of the riskiest places in your home. Not surprising because there's a lot of hard surfaces um, surrounding you. So if you were to fall, you're two and a half times more likely to sustain an injury in your bathroom than other locations of your home. So preventing injurious falls in the bathroom is really critical to support um, safe aging in place. Of bathroom falls that occur, the riskiest task is stepping into and out of your bathtub. So um, this is not surprising because what you're doing with this task is stepping over a large obstacle, that's this bathtub rim, and then you're stepping onto your bathtub surface, which is uh, likely covered in soapy water. The most important way that we can help prevent falls and support the task of stepping into and out of the bathtub is to install an appropriately designed and secured grab bar. So what we do, what we want is to um, have a grab bar that's mounted vertically at the entry point of the bathtub um, and this allows someone to grasp it proactively as they step into and out of the tub and support their balance. The grab bar should be designed such that you can get a power grip, same as a handrail on the stairs, we want to achieve a power grip with a grab bar and we also want it to be long enough so that you have a large area by which you can select your, your grasp location to support your balance as you transfer. Time to break out the cigars and chocolates. The waters off the BC coast are seeing an exciting baby boom of humpback whales. 
Researchers have documented 21 calves so far this year, nearly double the number in 2020. No one is exactly sure what's behind the successful breeding season. The humpback population has rebounded after whaling was banned in the 1970s. 25 years ago, experts say there were no humpbacks in the waters off southwest BC. Now, as many as 500 have been identified in the Salish Sea. Okay, I know that you are going to have the answer to this because you have the answer to everything. But how no long is a humpback whale pregnant for? I, I actually have no idea, Anita. Do you know? Oh, well, we looked it up, so I do know now. But um, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> it is longer than a human, 11 months. So lots of pregnant oh, bellies yeah. out there. I was just going to say, Anita, through experience, I think uh, two extra months is uh, <laughs> kind of pushing it for <laughs> I would respect have to agree. goes out. Yeah, respect goes out to the humpbacks, but that is great news. Uh, I've got some more news uh, regarding our Sunday storm. Uh, we now have uh, press releases from the BC government uh, just giving everyone a heads up for this impending storm on top of that special weather statement. Let me take you back to what we're watching, uh, still forming as uh, as we speak and through the Western Pacific, but this is where we're at as far as special weather statements. Now, Environment Canada will issue the warning as we get closer. So definitely I would start checking those warnings and we'll keep you posted on all our platforms through the weekend, uh, even tomorrow into Sunday morning so we get a better idea of what's happening. Okay, what's happening right now, this system moving into us overnight tonight into Saturday morning, that's a different low. That one is just a regular old rain event to kick off our weekend, although I'm seeing some lightning strikes showing up on the coast, not out of the question that we'll see a rumble on the south coast for Saturday morning. Saturday afternoon, we'll get a bit of a break and then Sunday night, there's the weather bomb in the making. So it is still too rapidly strengthened. It's going to do that as it tracks towards Vancouver Island. So watch as I take you through Saturday afternoon into Sunday early morning, sitting just off of Vancouver Island. Then it's going to sit and spin and weaken. So it just depends on how close we get that center of low uh, as far as how strong those winds are. But right now, parts of Metro Vancouver will see 80 kilometer per hour gusts Sunday night into Monday morning. It's just taking you through that timing again because it's hard to uh, picture it uh, just with a five-day forecast. Saturday afternoon, the sunny break. We may even see some sunny breaks to kick off Sunday morning, but Sunday night into Monday, that's when we're looking at the peak winds. So wind gusts uh, topping out over 100 kilometers per hour for parts of the island. But if that storm, Anita, gets any closer to us, we may actually actually see those wind gusts increase for Metro Vancouver. But the reason why we're, we're all talking about this storm is this is the kind of setup, Anita, where we see our biggest wind events, where we get these big lows that stall out off our coast or actually track across the coast. This is what leads to widespread trees down and power edges. So we will definitely keep you posted this weekend. For sure. And making sure everyone is staying safe this weekend. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. It's one of science fiction's largest scale epics. Frank Herbert's 1965 novel, Dune, set in the distant future at a grueling desert planet. The story is also rife with geopolitical allegory. Canadian filmmaker Denis Villeneuve has adapted it to the big screen. He spoke to Q host Tom Power about towing the line between blockbuster and high art cinema. Have a look. He is arguably the biggest director in Hollywood right now. Cut. Denis Villeneuve. Just looking at it. The man behind an impressive list of five Oscar-nominated films in just seven years. Ranging from his breakout hit on Sandiz to the cramped shootouts of Sicario to the vast futuristic vistas of Blade Runner 2049 and Arrival. Both films cementing Villeneuve's place among the best science fiction filmmakers of all time. Now that's a proper introduction. Okay. With those recent sci-fi blockbusters, Denis Villeneuve is fulfilling a dream that started as a teenager in Quebec when he first picked up Frank Herbert's novel, Dune. Dreams make good stories, but everything important happens when we're awake. And now Villeneuve is bringing it to the big screen. It's time. So congratulations on the film. Um, you must be delighted. It's a relief to uh, finally to be able to share it with the world, yes. So you were 13 or 14 years old or something like that when you first came across the book. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, at the time I was like a, a teenager that uh, I was kind of uh, into sci-fi. I'm try I was uh, reading everything that uh, I could find at the time. And, and uh, Dune had a striking cover and the title, and I felt in love and spontaneously with it. I mean, there's uh, something about the journey of the main character, Paul Atreides, his feeling of isolation, the way he was struggling uh, with the burden of, uh, of his heritage. All this weight on his shoulder and, and uh, then finally being able to find freedom through the contact with another culture, I thought was a beautiful idea. And when I, I discovered the book, it was in the same time that I, I, I was like uh, discovering what's the work of a filmmaker. I was getting more and more interested about what happened behind the camera. So it, there's a kind of coincidence between uh, discovering Dune and, and starting to dream of uh, making films. And it was like uh, just like a fantasy, but uh, it took me a while before I thought that I could one day bring this uh, movie to the screen. Were you apprehensive at all when it finally came your way? Um, I was apprehensive. To, that my, my fear was to not be able to please that teenager that uh, dreamed so big at the time because it can just be disappointing. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's like an impossible task to bring to life uh, uh, something that has been so close to, to, so close to your art and, and, your, and soul and that you dream for 40 years. And um, when I do movies, I um, try to put all my chips on the table. I, I love to jump and without having any net uh, to <laughs> say, no, but seriously, it's like art. I, I would have ate myself all of my life if I, if I had not tried it. Where do you think that comes from in wanting to jump without the net? Artistically, I must say. No, I, 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 right, of course. No, yeah, we don't have anything set up outside the door or anything like that, you know? Um, I'm, frankly, I don't want to to talk about myself, to, to, but I will say that uh, I'm an anxious human being. But when it comes to cinema, I just see what I need to do and, and uh, it's clear, the path is clear for me. So when I, I, I decided to do Dune, I said uh, that the, the challenge for me was to make sure that the story from a dramatic and a human point of view was accurate and uh, um, meaningful. Yeah. I know it's meaningful also that this people see this in theaters. Are you nervous at all? I mean, through the pandemic, we saw so much movie watching, which had already been uh, declining in people going to theaters. People, more people were watching at home. Are you, are you, are you ever worried about it? I'm worried. I mean, uh, and the fact that uh, the pandemic ha ha happened and a very bad timing for cinema where, where, where we were like, but I'm optimistic too. I think that uh, uh, as human beings, we need to uh, share experience with others. I mean, when we go to a rock concert, uh, we don't want to be alone in the room. I mean, it's the same with cinema. You cannot go through this experience at home. It's, it's, it's something that uh, can be only reproduced in, in theaters. And I think that um, the big screen will, will prevail. And uh, that's the, it's part of the language of cinema. Do you still feel like a Quebec filmmaker? Is that, is that still in these films you're making now? I think so. Yeah? Frankly, uh, my uh, influence are still uh, very French Canadian, <laughs> very from Quebec. So I'm like, uh, there's something about that that I still feel it, it's in my DNA. And uh, uh, Montreal is like, uh, it's, it's home and it has, uh, uh, there's a beautiful uh, um, creativity there that you can find in theater, in the dance community, and even in restaurants, there's like a, a freedom there that I found nowhere else. I love that, man. Like, I, I think I sort of imagined on the way in that you were living in some sort of like Citizen Kane style mansion in the, <laughs> in the Hollywood Hills or something like that. You know, I love that you're still in Montreal or like that's still so important to you. But, you know? but Mon Montreal is like, uh, for me, as a filmmaker, it's very important to stay in contact with, with that, that uh, vibration. You know, it's like uh, and every time I go back to Montreal, it's like I put a lot of it's like creative fuel for me to go there. Yeah. Well, maybe this is the way I'll, I'll close things off. Um, you know, I, I'm just going back to the very beginning when you were talking to me about making yeah, this yeah. film for my young self. So what do you think young Denis Villeneuve in the video store would think of this film? Honestly, I, w I will say, he will say not bad, not bad, because there's moments in the movie that are very close to that spirit. And every time, frankly, it brings tears in my eyes because it's the first time that this part of myself was able to express itself and, and uh, it's like a freedom to finally be honest <laughs> that I, I, I deeply love 
And uh, if you were seeing me, someone was coming inside the studio saying, okay, that's enough. No more movies for you. You did it. And it, and it, cinema is over. My first feeling would be gratitude <laughs> because I will say that was a, a ride. I, I, uh, I, was, I feel so blessed that I had the chance to at least one time in my life went into that zone of, of uh, yeah, and yeah. I love that. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. I'm looking forward to having you back when it happens. And always nice to talk to you. Thanks for coming in. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. A fortune telling pug is blowing up on social media all because of his daily predictions using his bones or not. After the break, meet Noodle and his owner. Wednesday afternoon, but here it feels like Saturday night. All eyes are on Harry. He's celebrating his 100th birthday by doing exactly what he loves. What are you looking forward to about this birthday, would you say? Seeing the family, uh, seeing my friends, doing a little bit of dancing. For Harry, a big part of what's always kept him going through the highs and lows is movement and music. His love affair with dance started early. He grew up in Dundee, Scotland, his first date at a dance hall. After serving in World War II alongside four of his brothers, he took a chance in Toronto, ready to build a life and find love. He met his wife, Marjorie, on a blind date. During the ride home, I, I thought, like the girl up behind me, she had a nice, deep, husky voice. Mm -hmm. And I thought, mm -hmm. maybe I should get to know her. So uh, the next day after the dance, I went up to her house and knocked on the door and said, thank you for the, being my partner for the evening. And, so on one thing led it to another, and another led to... <laughs> they danced together through the decades, but shortly after their 25th wedding anniversary, Marjorie got sick with cancer. Harry says the diagnosis came much too late. At just 63, she passed away. Harry found himself without a partner in life and on the dance floor. Andy, you were instrumental in getting your dad to dance again? It was obvious such a huge part of, uh, of my parents' life and it seemed like, you know, the obvious thing to do. I don't think you were quite ready to, you know, yeah. get out of the house again. I have to set myself challenges and do my utmost to make them, yeah. Because if I don't have anything difficult to reach for, I just kind of go, yeah. He's just this wonderful man who has danced most of his life, still dances, and that can't be said for many hundred year olds. He stands up straight, everybody in the hall stands up straighter and dances better when Harry's on the floor. Now ringing in his 100th birthday, surrounded by friends and family, inspiring everyone with his resilience and energy, not to mention those smooth moves on the dance floor. I hope I can dance as long as I can. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Celebrate the achievements and resilience of women with CBC Vancouver's Angela Starrett at the annual Dress for Success Luncheon. Learn more at vancouver.dressforsuccess.org. And CBC Vancouver returns as exclusive media sponsors of the Corleone Men's Choir. Don't miss their upcoming Remembrance Day concerts in November. Learn more at corleone.org. Okay, do you wake up every day wondering what will happen during the day? Well, a pug in New York City is giving us a little bit of insight. 
Now, I don't know about you, but it was like one o'clock in the morning, I was getting ready for bed and I was, I was hoping and wishing for a Bones Day. Oh my gosh, and we got one. This is Noodle, a 13-year-old rescue pug. His owner, Jonathan Graziano, films himself trying to wake up his pup each day. If he stands, it's a bones day, meaning it's a day to get stuff done. If he falls back into bed, it's a no bones day, and it's okay to take it easy. Noodle already had quite the following on social media before blowing up on TikTok. The pair visited the Today Show recently, where Graziano said the attention has been pretty overwhelming. I get mentions from people who say they, you know, they they were wait. You know, it was a Bones Day, so they decided to propose to their partner. Aww. It was a, you know, they put a down payment on their house. A woman the other day said it was a Bones Day, so she bought a lotto ticket and won half a million dollars. No way! Oh my gosh. Serious Bones, Bones Day. Every she'll day. Be on, she'll, she'll be on the show tomorrow. The I, I gotta book her. I can't yeah. keep up with it. Oh my gosh! Cristiano calls Noodle the light of his life and is thankful he gets to share him with the world. And in case you're wondering, because I sure am, well, today was a no-bones day, so you need to hold off, hang out on your couch, and enjoy the evening at home. Thanks for watching us tonight. I will see you back here on Monday, and Dan is here at 11. Good night.